and we're going to Right, go ahead, guys. All right. There we go. And I also do have the chat open just so everybody knows that if you want to make comments in the chat, you absolutely can, and we welcome that. And we love seeing your face. So if you have the chance to turn on your camera, that's awesome. Yeah, we'd love for you to do it. And if somebody is unmuted on accident. So. Got them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like somebody was in there and they didn't know. So. Um, I've got another person uh, joining me today. I'm just going to go check on her and make sure she can join us and, and be right back. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we have a lot of people who are just getting in the room as well, looks like. So. Cool, cool. All right. So we're talking about ethical decision making through self-awareness and emotional agility. And one of the things that John and I often say um, is we... We talk, we're sharing ideas with all of you. That's, you know, that's what this whole, the purpose of all this is. And you're not going to agree with every single thing that we have to say. And you may really agree with everything we have to say. And either way, we really want you to look at why do I agree? Why do I disagree? So just think about that. It's fine if you don't agree with us. Like we're totally fine with that. We know that there's more than one way to accomplish something. And so these are just ideas to present to you. And we think the, you know, the best training is one where you are embracing and understanding your own beliefs and what drives you, because that's what you're taking into working with other people and making decisions. Um, it's not something you know i i said or jennifer said it two weeks ago or five months ago so but it it is important to know your own beliefs and how they may drive you um in your in your thinking about certain things yep so that's our disclaimer so you don't have to put that's a stupid idea in the comments yes just sit with why you think it's a stupid idea yeah <laughs> and we we are totally fine with it yeah okay. so one of the things that we want to talk about and um have you changed the slide jennifer I'm trying there it goes all right um is that uh there, when when we're when we've been uh when jennifer and i've been to workshops around ethics one of the things that always kind of stood out to us was that um, it seemed like it was a real straightforward sort of cognitive um, approach to how we make decisions based on uh, based on what you know a scenario, and um, we've we've even uh, you know the the idea of their ethical decision-making models. But one of the things that we really um, think is important to pay attention to is that um, ethics and decisions around ethics aren't made in a vacuum. They aren't made um, it, with this idea of just the steps that we take and um, almost like a decision tree, that there's a lot of intersectionality that goes with that. And we wrote here the, the ethics, the morals, the laws, and the emotion. I, I would even add your own background, mm -hmm. um, your, your religion, uh, your culture. Yeah. culture. There's all these other things that um, we've noticed aren't really paid attention to as much. And so today, hopefully we uh, get a chance to 
kind of demonstrate that for y'all a little bit, how that, how, how other aspects play into decision making um, and what, what we think is important as far as considering those things when you are making ethical decisions. So one of the first things we would um, want to uh, do is just show you one of the many ethical decision-making models that's, that are out there. And um, this is a typical model where you collect information, state the options, apply ethical pr principle, make the decision, implement the decision. Um, and, and even that center part, identify the ethical problem. One of the things that it doesn't, it, that a lot of people have don't mention is that each one of these steps, there is an emotional element to it. And um, I, here's, here's my example. My example is, I, it, it's kind of a broad example. I hear people all the time say, that's not ethical what they're doing. Mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll say to them, point to the ethic. And they can't do it because what they're saying is, I don't like what they're doing. But it's not an ethical thing that they don't like. They just don't like what the person is doing. And so um, there's times where they say, I don't like this, this is unethical, and, and they can point to an ethic. But there are plenty of times I've been in conversations where it's not about ethics, it's about the emotional response someone's having to something that they're that that's happening, whether it's what another counselor is doing or a situation they're in, and and they house it under ethics because that's that's I think power. It, like it has power, yeah. When we say this is an ethical issue and we can't identify that, it really is we're trying to get somebody to listen, to hear us and to hear our opinion. I think the same thing is true. Like we say, oh yeah, that's a joint commission standard. You have to do that because that's a joint commission standard. I hear that as well. Because we think that gives it some sort of power. And I go, that's not a joint commission thing. Like it's the same thing. It's That's not an ethical thing. So we just, we want to pay attention to there is an emotion involved in all of this. And, and sometimes it's, it really is the idea of, um, it's funny, Jennifer, because a, a lot of times it's, I just don't like this. Yeah. So I, or I don't want this person to do this, or I don't want, um, or I can't do that because I'm confined by this instead of I don't want to do that which is a very different that's that's not a power place to be in it's it's now I have to justify it beyond just saying that's an ethical thing yeah which we're not saying that there aren't times that you just don't do something because it's not what you want to do like we get that too yeah so, so we want we want to uh, start with a scenario. I believe is the next thing, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So, so we want you to take a moment. Go ahead, John. We, we just take a moment and read this. I'm hoping everybody can see their slides. Oh. Gonna say something smart, Alex. So I'm very proud I stopped myself. <laughs> so my 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 first question um is 
as you as you read this and think of yourself in this position, what comes up for you? What are you telling yourself about yourself? What are you telling yourself about what you have to do or what you should do? So Carolee just wrote guilt. And Carolee, went, one of the things I, I appreciate and need to rescue. Call the PO. Contact PO. <laughs> so I, you know, one of the things that um that happens when when I'm reading this is what uh, Carolee and what a couple of y'all have said need to rescue need to do something so a lot of y'all are saying you need to do something what drives that idea that you need to do something What if I say you don't need to do anything? That feels really weird to me. I would definitely feel like I would need to do something. <laughs> because why? Is it an ethics? Why not ethics? It's more morals. Yeah, we've got comments in here. Oh. Obligation. Somebody else is saying that's true. We don't. But other people are saying it's their responsibility. That he's being unfairly jailed. Mm -hmm. So it, are there any ethical considerations that you need to be thinking about as a counselor? Somebody said there are ethics involved. A commitment to the well-being of the client. Damage to relationship with the client. And saying that the office may not have given accurate information, that the front office messed up. Mm -hmm. Other people are questioning maybe he, he hadn't been showing up to his appointments. Maybe that wasn't just about this one appointment. So one one of the things that um, it, it's a little bit tougher to do here, but is uh, we there's times where I when I'm training someone or if somebody's talking, I'll say, get out your code of ethics and point me to a principle. Because there's not going to be a principle that says unfairness needs to be taken care of. People are even asking, well, what's the, like, is there a release of information for the front desk to provide that information to the parole officer? Yep. And do you have a release of information to contact the parole officer? Typically you would. I mean, that's probably kind of an assumption. But let, let me ask this. If you did nothing, would you be violating ethics? We're getting no. Yes. No. Legally or personally, no. Yes. <laughs> no. Good question, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> Depends if he was showing up or not. People want more information, John. This is all the information Doppel's going to get. Yeah. Somebody says, let's go back to the previous slide. <laughs> I 
Um, and in the previous slide would start with the idea of, is there a problem? Is there an ethical problem you need to consider? Yeah. Identify the ethical problem. That's even before you get into the decisions. Right. There's a lot of like, because of the well-being of the client, there's ethics. But then other people are saying not ethics, but moral issues for me personally. Yeah. So really just by, I mean, we, we do these a decent amount. Chat's going crazy because there's so many emotions yeah. involved, you know, in these. And that, and, and quite honestly, that's our point. We don't have the answer. I mean, it do no harm. I could say do no harm to everything. I could say do no harm to canceling an appointment. Um, and so it, that's a judgment of, it, are you harming your client by this happening? What does harm mean? Um, and how is that defined? And would Doppel come after you if 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 I turned you in and said, this person went back to jail because of all of this? And you said, hey, I had appointments. This was told to the parole officer. They took uh, they took action. And there was nothing I could do about it. <laughs> What court sentence is on Saturday, John? <laughs> the badass court. That's what. That's, that's, that's what <laughs> well, and that's another piece, though, is that um, you know, if there if there are uh, circumstances that that aren't under your control. Yeah, Doppel may investigate, but if a, there was a complaint, but they don't believe they would issue any consequences as a result of this. Right. My guess is they would find no ethical problem with this, actually. Right. Ethical violation, I'd say it that way. And we're also not saying that you wouldn't want to do something and that you wouldn't it wouldn't be helpful to your relationship with your client to do something. We're not saying any of that. But what I would, what I'd also say is that this in the chat point out that ethics is, is not decided in a vacuum. Yeah. That there are a lot of things at play when you start, can, when you start thinking about ethical decisions that you make. And the thing about that is this is one where your 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 morals kick in and you and y'all a lot of y'all are erring on the side of client well-being. I think Tina Tina's Tina said that. There are um, several people, yeah. But what if your the emotion kicks in and you start thinking about well-being, but that drives you to an ethical violation because well-being could be oh they need clothes for a job interview or oh i'm gonna um i you know they need a place to live yeah they need you know their their kid needs to stay with them and i'm going to be the advocate for it because ethically uh, their well-being is a, is at risk Remember, most ethical violations are done with good intentions in mind. And good intentions are typically driven from an emotional place. One of the things Jennifer and I will say, at least I, I believe this really clearly, is we're not saying you have to try to rule out and get rid of your emotions when you're, when you're thinking about this. In fact, we're probably saying the opposite is that you have to honor that your emotions are part of decision making. And you have to honor that they are involved in how do I pay attention to how they inform my decision making. Yeah. 
because I think that's that's really what what we're arguing for is that we don't there's no door that we walk through as human beings that takes away all of our humanness that takes away all of our emotions that takes away all of our care for our clients or care for people's well-being or you know it doesn't shut off our hearts and our compassion and so we just need to be aware of what our emotional responses are. We have to tease all those things out. We have to pay attention to what is what is an ethical issue? What is, you know, our emotional response and why we're having that. And, and I think it's wow. it's clear from just the chat that emotion and reasoning are always interacting together. Mm -hmm. There's there's constant interaction with that. And so to to I, I think to think you can just walk through a step by step model and eliminate the emotional interaction at each of those steps is is kind of I personally think it's fooling yourself. I think that's why when John and I talk about, and actually somebody just said this, consultation with other professionals help monitor your emotions and will keep you safe. Exactly. Because most of the time when there is a clear ethical violation and somebody is being receiving consequences for that, it's because they have not consulted with other people or they have consulted and have not followed what all those other people have said. Yeah. And I'll say this, I, I've consulted with Jennifer and tried to recruit her onto my side. <laughs> and so I so my emotion, even when I'm consulting, my emotions are there. Yeah. I try to hide them because I'm trying to recruit her. Right. I want I want someone to tell me what I want to hear. Um, even if I'm even if I'm open to hearing other things. I'm going to spin the story in the way that I'm already seeing the story. Right. Yeah. So this you want to talk about this, Jennifer? Yeah. What we what we really look at is how can you be self-reflective in the work that you do? How can you pay attention to your own emotional responses? your own reactions and really utilize those in the relationships with your clients in a positive way, as well as maintain that connection to your own responses and making sure they don't get in the way of mm -hmm. how we're working with people. Because they do sometimes. Yeah. We believe very strongly in... We had somebody um, in a training say, well, but at this age, these people should not be, these kids should not be doing this. So maybe I could understand them doing this at this age, but not at this age. <laughs> and which isn't a, you know, inherently a bad thought or anything, but how are you going to interact with that individually differently based on their age. Yeah. Yeah, the whole idea of, you know, this this 12 year old sneaking out to see her boyfriend. Yeah. And, I, and that's something that really needs to be taken care of. Well, if they were 17 or 16 or 15 or 14 and a half, Where's the cutoff to where you're not concerned, as concerned about it? And then is that driven by, is there research about that or is that driven by you? So we just really believe that we've got to be aware of our own stuff. <laughs> I think that's the simplest way to say it. Let's be aware of our own stuff. Let's pay attention to it. And, and this idea of emotional agility comes from uh, someone named Susan David, 
Mm-hmm. And, and she talks about the idea that all emotion informs us and we need to be, um, we need to embrace it, invite it into our, our thinking and invite it into how it, how it informs us just as much as a cognitive process of figuring out, you know, what each step of those ethical, um, ethical steps toward making a decision because they they are interacting together and so if i'm just saying well obviously this is the this is the decision i'm going to make or obviously this is the way i should be doing this that that you know obviously i need to um help them to uh you know stand up for themselves in 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 the courtroom or with some sort of social service and so i'm going to show up there and i'm going to i'm going to be an advocate for them well that's not that's not necessarily wrong but that's not just driven by a cognitive process that you say oh here's the ethic well-being that means I'm going to go on a Saturday and show up for them um, to support them. Mm-hmm. Because I like them, the other clients that I don't like, I wouldn't do that for. But you don't say those parts. Yeah. And I thought, I mean, really, there were a, a lot, lot of ideas, ideas in there of like, very you know let me get the that front desk person to call the probation officer right now while i'm in session like there was a a lot of good problem solving in the chat around it good things none of which were like bad things to do but i also think then there was the uh, because if if you're driven by i've got to do something that that's that is as, an aspect of your emotional response and if i if i say front desk person you call the probation officer uh, parole officer and i don't and i'm not thinking about is there a release is there you know what's the implication of that mm-hmm. um and so i'm i'm making decisions that i'm not fully paying attention to all the things that are informing me and what drives it. I'm just driven by, I've got to do something. So there really isn't an answer. No. That scenario. No, we have another scenario in a minute and there's no answer to that too, by the way. (laughs) Just to give y'all, just give y'all the... (laughs) the heads up (laughs) yeah and um gina said if you do for one don't you have to do the same thing for everybody yep and i would say that's more of an ethical thing than that whole scenario is this what's the favoritism that you're providing that'll get you in more trouble yeah (laughs) Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, that's, that's one of the, that's one of the questions that um, Doppel would ask is, um, is this a, is this a practice that you do with all of your clients? Yeah. So we give you these, these four key concepts of emotional agility. Again, this is from Susan David, because we really like it. Mm-hmm. We really like how this focuses on everything John just said, that how do you make emotional, how do you include your emotions in kind of your decision-making and recognize and use it as a piece of information for you? And so, I mean, you can study more about her and her work. We really like it, but I think it's one of the concepts that came up a lot in the chat is like the walking your why. So paying attention to the why that you're feeling that need to do something and noting it 
Like, is that because that first comment was guilt? Mm -hmm. Am I feeling guilty because I'm sick? And then am I saying, well, see, I should never, ever cancel appointments for being sick. I should just go in. My self-care isn't important. You know, so are we walking our why? Are we looking at what our core values are? And is that keeping us in the right direction? So, and, yeah, and I think one of one of her ideas that I really like is we we as a society um, try as as quickly to re as possible to remove what we determine are negative emotions. Yes. And instead of sitting with them. So if I feel guilty, it's going to drive me to do things. I'm going to try to take action so I can get rid of my guilt. I'm trying to eliminate that because it's an un, it's an undesired emotion. Mm -hmm. And her idea about emotional agility is if you have guilt, if you feel, you know, the, this sadness or, or, uh, whatever that you've you you we typically consider as undesirable how do we invite it in and learn and let it and let it um sit and sit with it and let it be a part of what informs us just like if we were happy about this or if we were um you know the things that we see as positive emotions that we don't work our butts off to try to get rid of as quickly as possible. I love the idea of stepping out because she says, let's just step back from the emotion and really ask it what it's trying to tell us. What information is it trying to provide to us? Just like we do with our thoughts. We, we're much better at looking at our thoughts and saying, what's that thought telling me? She's also saying, let's do that with our emotions. Let's step out and look at the emotional response and see if we can really understand what information it's trying to give to us. And I, I'd go as far to say that probably because of good intentions, probably one, I don't even know if this is an emotion, but the, the idea of, for me when I get in sticky situations is when I consider something unfair because I have a huge unfair meter. And when I consider things unfair, it, 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 it uh, generates some sort of emotion, which I can't name at the moment, but it makes me want to do something to get rid of the unfairness that I have decided whether it's something unfair happening to my clients, whether it's something unfair I've done. Um, but when, when that comes up for me, that's one of my big things that becomes a driver. And can I step out and, and, th and, and really pay attention to what, what's happened for me that unfairness has come up for me? Yeah. Yeah, and that's good for you to be awareness, to have in your awareness. Because if I, unfairness, when my unfairness meter goes off, that's a driver for me that I have to pay attention to because it will inform me and try to convince me to do things. I have a friend that worked with a, a couple and um, the couple ended up breaking up it was a married couple they ended up divorcing he continued on with with her he, the the guy had an affair and was an alcoholic and some other things he continued on with her and there was some custody stuff that happened and he went to court and the lawyer for the wife um asked him to come to court and he testified and and he had a release from the wife to talk about you know their meetings and they had been meeting for several months probably even a year and he talked about you know the reasons that were that happened for breaking up and why this guy why this 
uh, wives should have custody um, and, and why, you know, the type of custody she was trying to get. He was just sort of advocating for her. And the, the guy uh, complained to Doppel because the guy had not um, given him a release. And he and he he was he was doing it out of he thought it was unfair that this guy was trying to get custody and take the kid out of state and all this stuff. But um, he didn't think one bit about the idea of getting a release and and on the stand had said when they were doing couples counseling, blah, blah, blah. But that was that was him being driven by that that idea of unfairness without paying attention to, um, you know, what what the implications of it are. Yeah. So we we make note here that here's the most common complaints to ethics boards. And um, that really our principles, the codes, they're not completely sufficient to ensure ethical behavior amongst us. Yeah, and boundary issues are the, the biggest one. Yep. And boundary issues often are, uh, often happen because of, of um, good the, intention. Yeah, there's good intentions, and and so we can convince ourselves based on not just a cognitive but an emotional and a moral process to to step over a boundary. I had um uh, someone I was supervising who was working with a family and a kid and and the kid needed a book or something for for school or I forget and they didn't they had no money this kid was not going to get this book and she had the book she actually had it she didn't even have to go buy it so she convinced herself without talking to me to bring the book to their house and drop it off on their front porch and just leave. And she convinced herself that they'll never know who's who brought it. They'll never know, you know, how it got there. They'll never know any of this. It's pretty good intention. Feels good. But if you just went from a total black and white way of thinking, that's an ethical violation. But it, it's, it's, I, I joke about, I think I said this yesterday, Jennifer, the worst committee you could ever have is me, myself, and I. Yeah. <laughs> so even in the chat, somebody is saying like, look at yourself as if you were your coworker. Can you sit and talk about this and step outside yourself in the scenario? And then Philip, you're asking, so are you saying that there's no ethical grounds for an accusation of malpractice if you do nothing in the situation? And are you looking at the, the role play, the case scenario that we brought up? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's really not an ethical issue. Is that how you want to practice? That's your that's the other side of it. And so it's really asking those questions. And we said there's no answer to this one because we're if you're in that scenario, you may very quickly go, okay, I, I want to do something. And we're just suggesting that you ask yourself. Is that an obligation that I have ethically or is this an emotional thing because I feel really bad that I missed work yesterday and missed this appointment? And so it's 
how are you making that decision? Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And I think a, I think a lawyer that has your professional liability, the lawyer on your side would say, there's nothing around this. Mm -hmm. You did nothing illegal. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm just considering like if if your client gets out of jail and or, or, or gets resentenced and the sentence is worse and then there's there's some kind of um, he he uh, files a suit of malpractice against you for getting resentenced. Yeah. Yep. You're allowed to get sick and you're allowed to cancel appointments and, you know, all those things are allowed. We intentionally made that a very highly emotional scenario. <laughs> so there, I, in a real life scenario, there'd be, I'm sure, some other time frame in there. It wouldn't be a Friday that you're getting sentence on a Saturday, it'd probably be more like a Monday, but there'd be some, you know. No, I really appreciate that example. It's a, it's a really good example. And I think a very realistic one that a lot of us actually face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's been yeah. Uh, good, good guidance and feedback on that. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we're getting some other, there's a difference from a professional view versus a parental view. When you become a parent to your clients, this is when ethical violations occur. Yes, being sick is not an ethical issue. You're allowed to cancel, get sick. And then the, the concern is my office gave the courts inaccurate information. So yeah, it, there's absolutely things that you're going to do in response. I, I would add a, a, to that scenario what if you thought you would be in danger? What if you thought your client would come after you if they got thrown back in jail? Because that's a real part too. Mm -hmm. Is that they would, they would seek revenge and you thought that that could happen. Now, nothing has changed around what ha what happened, but would that motivate you in a different way? What other emotions come up for you? What other things happen for you to that would drive what you do? Yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure we get to the other scenario because I think everybody likes talking about this. So we're just pointing out that emotions and reasoning are they're in interacting to influence our moral behavior. So we look at all of those and how and, that and all is playing out. Y'all get y'all get these slides. The the yeah. one thing I like about the little um, circular thing is that when we talk about morals, I I like that they break down some of the ideas around morals and that there's a moral sensitivity, there's a moral judgment, there's a more mo, moral motivation. So who I want to be and you know as a person, but then there's also the moral judgment of of what is what makes for a, a you know a good moral uh, life and whatever, but. I, I I like that there's um, there's a little bit of of fleshing out of what what type of moral place we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Even the moral of what will other people think about me? Yeah, what our character really is. Yeah. Ready for another scenario? <laughs> okay. Okay, so what are people's responses?
What emotions are coming up? What are you telling yourself about the parents? Who do you like? Who do you not like? Who are you rooting for? And are the people that you think are getting in your way? How come the parents call say that he's a boy at the beginning and a girl in the middle? Like, sounds like they're confused too. Good question. Yes, also understanding how much if the parents are misgendering the child that affects the child's mental health. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? The parents are saying, oh, my, our daughter is doing great now. We don't think that she needs to come back. And by the way, the parents don't call him a boy. They do. Says your client states that he has been cutting. Right. Oh, your says your good. client has been brought in by his parents. Yes. So I don't know who's writing or whatever, but this thing's kind of a hot mess. <laughs> there's a lot of yeah gender i guess if the parents want to take the child out of therapy you could provide resources because if they're going to take them out yeah so that's somebody else is saying there's a lot of like parents are in denial and a safety plan should be created and let's give them referrals. Is there an ethical obligation? Well, how come the therapist is calling him a boy and the parents are calling him a girl? I think that might wanna get figured out first. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. that's that's confusing, I mean, and that's probably driving some of the depression, which might be driving some of the suicidal ideation. I mean, the the client the the therapist is honoring what the fourteen year old is identifying as. Yeah, and the parents are honoring that their kid is a biological female. So the 14 year old identifies as he, him. And so the therapist, the counselor is honoring that and calling the client, he, him. Yeah. The parents are not. It also sounds like the parents don't have accurate information about the suicidal ideations. So I'll say if they did and they don't care, they're pulling their kid out because you're calling him he. Do you have an ethical obligation to do something? Is the child, he's 14, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, could you call DCFS? I don't think there is an ethical obligation here. If the parents are informed, um, it's kind of in their hands at that point where he's not actively suicidal, but having thoughts, I, it would suck and you'd feel for the kid. But at that point, I think you've done what you could. So somebody else in the chat is also saying, ethics say you can't do anything unless there's abuse, neglect or active suicidal ideation. Right? So that's exactly what you're saying as well, Brooke. 
I say to my supervisees, unfortunately, um, crummy parenting is an abuse. Mm -hmm. Some most of the time, right? Parenting that we don't like isn't necessarily abuse. What if we know there's research that says them them being hard pretty hard on staying with calling their child daughter and she and not honoring the pronouns um puts the kid at a bit more of a risk of suicide we have that knowledge well, would it be ethical after having started individual therapy to maybe have a family meeting with the therapist to try and work out some of those problems? I would say, yeah, that's that would be appropriate. I don't know if it's ethical, but it'd be, in my view, it'd be good strategy. It'd be good counseling. Yeah, exactly. I think the key is on on these scenarios that we're presenting there there isn't like we're not going to go through all the answers of it but yeah. we're we want you to be aware of wait a minute I don't I'm not liking these parents right now because they're not doing that or these this kid needs to whatever whatever response you're having like pay attention to that Pay attention to where you're sitting and what emotions are coming up for you, who you like, who you don't like, what you feel like you need to, to do in this scenario as well. And, and, how, and how that drives us. You know, if, if you don't like what is happening, we'll search for things to name it. Um, we have great language um, in our field to... Um, to justify how we feel about things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important piece is that if I don't, if I don't like what's going on, I'm going to start, I'm going to start on a path if I'm not being intentional of trying to find stuff to name this, to justify taking some sort of action that may or may not be appropriate. There's lots of good responses. You guys, there's there's a lot of good responses, which also indicates that when you're in these scenarios, it's so good for us to reach out to one another and to collaborate and consult because then we can start to decide what should we do? Or is this patient at risk? How can I assist this, this family, this kid? What, you know, what do I need to do in this scenario? And is that an ethical thing, a moral thing, or is that an emotional thing that's driving that, or is it all of those? So it's it's really just thinking about that. Beth says, I think offering what we can to increase education for the parents, offering to safety plan, offering other resources, providing numbers to contact, they can say no, but at least we can offer something to them. Mm -hmm. And I think we could argue that that would help us feel better about these parents pulling them out of it's, therapy. Yeah. And, and on the flip side, you know, if if you're not paying attention and you're driven to try to do something, trying to get them back, try to whatever, I've I've even heard of let's try to get the 14 year old without the parents knowledge i've i've heard that kind of because of an advocacy kind of uh, emotion and the and you know I, the other side of it is if you pursue too hard then now we're talking about an eth now we are talking about ethics mm -hmm. you aren't giving the clients agency yeah you're not giving them choice in whether to because it is the parent's choice just by the kid's age. You're not giving choice 
to the family. Yeah. And then I can point to an ethic when it comes to that. Yes, that's Lisa. That's why both of these scenarios aren't just made up. I mean, they're they come from things that happen. Right. Yeah. And I want to make note that we've been very busy in the chat, so I don't want anybody to miss that the evaluation form to get your CEUs is actually in the chat and Joseph put that in there. I just want to make sure everybody sees that because I know we just have two minutes left and a lot of people run out to go to see their next client. So, so the bottom line it, with, with, with this presentation, hopefully, is that it, it highlights to you that if you just look at the chat for a half a second and people coming up with ideas and things like that, we that that we fall into places what that activate us mm -hmm. and to not that that's don't try to press that down but embrace that we are emotional human beings and that informs us just like any other any other cognitive process that we go through and to believe that there is a just a cognitive process with, and we can eliminate the emotion out of it, I think is, is a dangerous thing because our cognitive process has filters and those filters are driven by our morals, our background, our, con our culture, our emotions. And those are things that we just, we just want to, bring up to people to consider that that your your decisions aren't made in that kind of vacuum mm -hmm. yeah so i think it's it's just coming back to how can we create a self-reflective habit yeah in the work that we're doing and then i think the other thing john and i always say is just to make sure you're you're collaborating. Don't don't make these decisions in isolation. Interact with one another. Yeah. And and listen to what people have to say. Yeah. Even if, they, even if it's not what you want to to hear. Yeah. So we appreciate those of you that are attending and have contributed to the conversation. So good stuff, you guys. Yeah, it's good seeing y'all. Look at the chat is just, <laughs> y'all have lost your dang minds. Well, they're saying thank you and goodbye too. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very thought provoking. These, these kind of scenarios, they bring up a lot of emotions for us. Hope y'all have a wonderful day. Go do good things and go be emotional with people. <laughs>